Okay. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and one God, amen. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, online again. Unfortunately, we have, we're going back to the Zoom um, sermons on Sundays at 1030, unless we uh, come up with a better plan. And hopefully you guys had a chance to look over the Sunday Gospel. The Sunday Gospel came from Matthew chapter 18, uh, verses 1 through 9. And I'll read a little bit of it. But before we get started, uh, just to know where we are in the year, this is the second Sunday of the Blessed Month of Abid. And if you remember last month, the focus was on the Holy Spirit. And this month is about uh, the apostles. And we see how our Lord supports his apostles. He gives them authority and he gives them the, the task to serve the world. And um, just from the beginning of the gospel passage from today, Matthew 18, verses 1 through 9, um, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to himself, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so today what we're going to talk about is this one thing. Without this one thing, we cannot be saved. It was very clear. And let's see if you were paying attention to what I just read. Without this one thing, we cannot be saved. Without this one thing, you cannot go to heaven. Without this, all of your virtues can actually become sources of sin. And all of your good works can turn into dust. It's the one thing that's absolutely necessary for our salvation. Do you know what it is? If you're reading with us um, from Matthew chapter 18, uh, it's a little thing that we call uh, humility. You know, we're not talking about the sacraments today. We're talking about humility. Um, in verse 4, it says, Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So, humility is something more that God requires of you, even more importantly than he requires of the sacraments. I know that's a little bit controversial for me to say, but we'll go into that a little bit in details. If you don't have humility, it says, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. It's very clear. It's very straightforward. Without humility, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. If you don't have a heart that is humble, I don't care. It doesn't matter if you've been going to the Orthodox Church for 70 years. It doesn't matter if you memorized every detail of every council. It doesn't matter if you know all the canons of the church and you know Old Testament and New Testament scripture by heart. It doesn't matter if you take a pilgrimage to every holy site of the world. And if you go to the monasteries and if you go to the convents, it doesn't matter if you've given all your money to the poor. If you puff up your chest with pride and you pat yourself up on the back because of it, and if you feel like you've, got, you've done uh, God a favor by entering into his kingdom, then you, then you have not entered his kingdom. Pride is death. You can faithfully walk with God for 70 years. You can be in the church every time that the doors are open. You can take and partake of all the sacraments. You can study the Bible day and night. You can pray seven times a day. And it only takes one sin called pride. You puff up your chest a little bit and you pat yourself on the back for being so faithful and being so good to God, for being so much more righteous than everybody else for being so much smarter, for having studied more, for being more generous. It's the same sin that was able to turn angels into demons and the archangel into the devil himself. It's the same sin that will prevent you from entering the kingdom of heaven. You know, at the same breath, you can spend 70 years of your life in wickedness and in sin, never setting foot in the church, never... Um, never partaking of a single sacrament, turning your back on Christ your entire life. But while there's still a window of time, that window of hope, if the Holy Spirit still pricks your heart and 
even in those last moments of your life, you respond and you begin to weep over your sins and you fall down on your knees and you fall down on your face in front of God and you realize that you come to him completely empty handed. You're not bragging of a single book that you've read or a single church service that you've attended or a single penny that you gave to charity, but completely empty handed, begging God for mercy because you know that you're a sinner and you know that you could have spent your life in wickedness. You could be like the thief on the right hand, hanging there, knowing that you hang there because you deserve it, because you're a thief, because you simply, and you simply turn to Christ and say, please remember me in your kingdom. And in that emptiness and in that brokenness and that humility before God, our Lord will turn to you and say, I tell you this day, you will be with me in paradise. For 2,000 years, the church has prayed Kiri Laison, has prayed, Lord, have mercy. We've prayed, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mercy is only for the undeserving. What does it mean to ask for mercy? Mercy can only, by definition, be given to the undeserving. If you deserve it, then it's not mercy. So many of our prayers are filled with requests for favors. When our prayers should be filled with requests for mercy, right? I've sinned. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against the creator of the universe. I can't say I don't deserve the consequences of the sins. See, sometimes we do compare ourselves with Christ and we realize that we fall short. Sometimes. We're humble enough to ask God for things. And yet, we stop short of asking for mercy because in the back of our minds, we think, you know, I'm not that bad. I mean, I know I'm not as good as Christ, but you don't have to be perfect to get into heaven. I, I'm, only, I'm way better than all those who are outside the Orthodox Church, right? I know that I, I know more about Orthodoxy than most people. I show up to church more often than most people. You know, I'm pretty good. And so then we ask, Lord, please grant me salvation. Please grant me entrance into the kingdom of heaven. And it's good that we ask for that. But we don't quite think of it as mercy. Because in the back of our minds, we think, I'm good enough. I'm decent enough. I'm loving enough to my family and to my kids. I do good enough for them, right? That really God should let me into heaven. Really, he should, because I'm not that bad. And as long as we're thinking like that, we're failing to ask for mercy. You know, you might be asking for a payment for good works. You might be asking for a favor, but you're not asking for mercy. Mercy is only given to the undeserving. And the only way God is going to give you heaven is if you recognize in your gut, if you recognize in your heart that we don't deserve to go there. It's not just, Lord, do me a favor and let me get into heaven. It's not just, Lord, let me into heaven because that's really what I deserve. No, it's, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Are we willing to call ourselves a sinner? It takes humility to do that. And without humility, you will not see the mercy of God. So we humble ourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. You know, we're told in scripture, everyone who exalts himself will be put down. But everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Do you want to be exalted? Do you want to be justified? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? Right? The only way up is down. The only way to ascend is into the heavens is by getting on your knees. The only way to the ascension is through the cross. And so we have to humble ourselves before the Lord. And so when I'm talking about all this, you might be thinking, so what is the role in the church in all this? You know, you just said, Abuna, you just said, I could be a faithful Orthodox Christian for 70 years. And then near the end of my life, I could get puffed up with pride and lose everything. Sort of like King Uzziah in the Old Testament. He was faithful for 52 years. And then he got puffed up with pride. And he decided that he was going to pretend to be a priest. And God struck him with leprosy and he was banished. And he ended up being what? Buried even among the lepers, not even with the kings. 
right? So consider that. And then Abuna, you told me that you can be wicked for 70 years, never set foot in church, never love God, never do anything good. And if you still have a heartbeat, and if you still have a breath, and if God should send his Holy Spirit to prick your heart and convict you, if you choose to humble yourself before the Lord and beg for his mercy and beg for forgiveness, that you can be saved. You can enter the, into the kingdom of heaven just like King Manasseh of the Old Testament. Do you know King Manasseh and his story? He spent his entire life outdoing the wickedness of all the former kings of Israel. Not only did he worship pagan gods, but he also encouraged the worship of pagan gods, and he even brought pagan idols and false gods into the temple of Jerusalem. You know, you think that the statue of Baal is bad. How about a statue of Baal in the temple where God is supposed to be worshipped? Manasseh did this. And if that wasn't enough, do you know what else Manasseh did? He is the one, by his command, is the one who tortured the prophet Isaiah. Right? It was because of King Manasseh and his command that they tortured uh, Isaiah the prophet. And do you know where Manasseh is now? He's in heaven. In scripture, we read the prayer of Manasseh and his, his prayer of humble repentance at the end of his life. When he recognized his great wickedness, he poured out his heart before God and he begged for mercy. And God had mercy on him and forgave him all of his sins. I have no doubt that Manasseh is with the saints in heaven, even after living such a life. And so again, you might think, so what's the role of the church? So first of all, you have to remember that you don't know how much longer you have to live. God has given you no guarantee that you will spend 70 years on earth. There is nothing more arrogant, more prideful, more presumptuous than to say, well, I'm going to live my life for myself. And at the end of my life, before I die, I give crumbs to God. That is very arrogant. We may die very quickly and unexpectedly very suddenly, and then it'll be too late for repentance. So the concept of turning your back to the church on purpose and to live in sin on purpose so that you can repent when you're old is a path taken by the very arrogant, very prideful. And so, as we have already said, that the very arrogant are those who will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless they repent. But there is something else that those of us who have chosen to be faithful, who have chosen to struggle, those of us who have chosen to be in the church, those of us who believe that baptism washes away our sins. We believe that the chrismation is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Eucharist is the body and the blood of Christ that washes away the sins and is the medicine of life. We believe all these things. What can be said of us? I would simply remind all of us that everything in the church from birth to death is calculated to help you and to help all of us on the path of humility. The church knows how critical it is to have humility, how necessary it is to have humility. Everything the church does is calculated for the sake of humility. Think of baptism. The church doesn't say, well, as soon as you decide that you're ready, as soon as that you decide that you've learned enough, as soon as that we agree that you know what you need to know, Okay, now that you're you know, 12 years old, or now that you're 15 years old, now you can join the church. No, your mom and your dad are Orthodox Christians, and they come together in love, and they have this child, and this child is born. And before the child learns even his own name, before the child even learns to speak, you give that child the name a Christian. You baptize that child in water in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that child grows up in the midst of the church, never presuming to say, well, I'm Orthodox because I was smart enough to become Orthodox. Now, the converts have to struggle with those kind of thoughts. We all have to struggle with those kind of thoughts. I was smart enough to become Orthodox. I was smart enough to remain Orthodox. You know, the normal life of the church is for you to be born into the church to be baptized in the church as an infant so that you still have that humility. So that even while you're a 50-year-old man, 
or a 50 year old woman, you can't say, well, I became Orthodox because I was smart enough or holy enough. No, what you can say is that this was a great gift that was given to me before I was even old enough to know what was going on. Think of the Eucharist. All of us from three years old to 103 years old can come down, approach the Eucharist. And we don't presumptuously walk all the way up to the altar and grab the chalice with our own hand and grab the Eucharist with our own hand and feed ourselves. Why? That's not what we do. All of us, we come forward. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter how poor you are. It doesn't matter your status in life. You come forward and you kneel and you open your mouth and you wait to be fed. Is there any humility in that? There's a reason why the priest feeds you. It's Christ feeding you. You don't feed yourself. You don't presume to touch the Eucharist yourself. You wait. You wait for Christ to feed you with his body and his blood. And it really teaches us humility. Think about the way that we interpret the Bible. It's not just about learning what the right doctrines are. It's also why you believe those are the right doctrines. I mean, it is possible without help from the church that you could sit down by yourself and just by reading the Bible, you can come to your own personal and private conclusion that we need baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, you could do that. On your own, you could study the Bible and you come to the conclusion that we need to have infant baptism, that we need bishops, that we need priests, that we need deacons. You can come to all the conclusions on your own and many, many people have done so. And those conclusions could be just as correct as the conclusions that the church has come to, right? The doctrines that the church teaches. But there's a big difference. Are you believing in these things because you trust in your own reasoning powers and your own powers of study? Or do you believe these things because just like you take the Eucharist, you also allow the church to feed you the word. You allow the church to feed you the teachings of the apostles. Let's just assume that by the grace of God, Everyone who's listening to this has perfect theology. There's no mistakes whatsoever. It's still not good enough. It's not just a matter of knowing what the right answer is to a test question. It also matters why you think you got the right answer. If your answer is, I got the right answer because I studied enough and I'm smart enough and I've got this all figured out and I've got the Holy Spirit with me, then we still have some work to do. But you can say correctly, this is what the church has taught for thousands of years. This is part of the deposit of faith handed down to us by Christ and the apostles. I'm not trusting in my own studies. I humble myself on my knees before the teachings of the church, because ultimately I submit myself to the teachings of the church. And what about all this talk in the Orthodox Church about obedience? I mean, that's a very un-American word if you ever heard one. Obedience. Unless we're demanding other countries to obey us. Americans are all about independence, about self-reliance. We do it ourselves. We take care of it ourselves. I don't need anybody else, right? But that's not okay in the kingdom of God, right? We don't do it by ourselves. And it's built into the very fabric of the church. You're not supposed to come up with your own daily prayer rule. No, but you go to your father confession, you get it approved, you talk to him and he says, okay, this is what your daily rule should be. You don't just decide for yourself what you're going to be a bishop or a priest. No, you become a priest, you become a deacon because the bishop tells you, because you've been called. We have the church teachings that, that teaches us obedience, even to the leaders of the church. We have the church teaching us obedience to the powers that be within society obedience of children to parents. The church teaches us obedience, obedience, obedience. Why? The reason why we're put under all this obedience in the Orthodox Church in so many different contexts is because God is trying to teach us humility. So some concluding thoughts. Humility is necessary for salvation. The next time you run into one or more aspects of the church that makes you feel humbled, right? One more thing about orthodoxy that makes you feel like you're taking orders 
rather than giving them. That's because the church knows that without humility, not one of us will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not just about answering the questions right on the exam. It is about having your heart humbled before God, humbled before your brothers and sisters. If you can't look in the mirror and see a sinner, see someone who's undeserving, if you can't look and think for a second that about actually humbling yourself before the teachings of the church, about doing what the church commands, about being obedient and letting the church interpret scripture for you instead of trusting in your own ways, if you can't imagine doing any of this for a second, we might have a problem for pride. And just remember, pride is the only sin that it took to convert angels into demons and an archangel into the devil. It was because of pride that the angels lost heaven. But St. Augustine says something very beautiful. He says, it's through humility that even the lowly men can become like angels. So we have to ask ourselves real questions. Do you want salvation? Do you want forgiveness? Do you want joy? Do you actually want to go to heaven? Then in your mind and in your heart and even with your knees, we humble ourselves for it is only through humility that we will see the face of God. And glory be to God forever. Amen.